Welcome back to Mr. Brown's Basement, a channel devoted to the craft of repairing, restoring, and modifying vintage electronic gear, and other random stuff. Today I'm going to be asking, can this projector be easily taken apart and repaired? But first, a bit of background. I picked up this projector from Amazon.ca back in 2023 because I wanted to set up a small home theater system in my living room. On the one hand, I like to watch videos and content on a large screen, but on the other, I don't like the look of a TV hanging on the wall when I'm entertaining guests. This projector, branded Emoten Model N1, seemed to be a good fit. What I really like about it is that it has built-in apps like YouTube and Netflix, which make it super easy to use. I have it connected up to a Dolby surround receiver and it's more than enough for my modest space. I didn't get a chance to set it up here until March 2024, and it worked spectacularly well until it stopped in March 2025. I was getting distracting darkened regions in the picture, which told me something in the optical system had begun to fail, possibly the LED light emitter, LCD panel inside, or something else. A projector should last longer than a year, or about 1,500 runtime hours. It says right there, the LED lifespan is 30,000 hours. So you would expect the lifespan of the entire projector to be at least 30,000 hours. Missed it by that much and I'm not happy with just throwing it away now. The first thing I did was reach out to the seller and ask if they could obtain replacement components if I needed them. The answer from the seller was concise. We'll sell you a new one. It's shameful that after only one year, it's garbage, or in my case, e-waste. So with nothing to lose, I decided to open it up and see if I could locate and fix the problem. As you see, there's no obvious way of opening this thing up. There are no screw heads at all. Sometimes screw heads are cleverly hidden underneath the rubber feet. So let's check that out. There's nothing under there except adhesive that holds on the rubber feet. A gap is clearly visible between the bottom of the projector and the sides. Likely, there are concealed clips that hold the bottom to the sides. The best way to defeat the clips is to pry the case open with a spudger tool and then use other spudgers to ensure the case doesn't clip back together while another part is being separated. After going all the way around the bottom, there was no way the bottom of the projector was going to come out of the case non-destructively. Clearly, this is not the way into this projector. I was thinking that maybe the reason why the guts wouldn't separate from the case is because there are screws holding it in, possibly hidden behind this lens bezel. It doesn't look like they used plastic clips, though. This piece doesn't want to come off. I'm guessing that they maybe used glue or double-sided sticky tape to hold it on. To defeat adhesives, you can try alcohol or a controlled source of heat. I decided to use this hair dryer to heat while prying. Unfortunately, I found myself at another dead end. There was a very fine, almost imperceptible gap between the case and the top. I wish I had known that is the way to get inside. There are two cables running from the top to the logic board. One is to the on-off illuminated button switch, and the other is to an infrared sensor, probably for the remote. One or both of these cables will have to be released to go any further. Many, but not all of the connectors are covered by a spot of hardened glue, which will have to be scraped away before they can be disconnected. Resist the temptation to remove the four screws that hold in the logic board. You can remove them, but they won't get you anywhere. I went down this rabbit hole, and you don't have to. Instead, focus on removing the five screws that attach the bracket supporting the logic board. Next, remove the cables to the logic board. Some will stubbornly want to stay in. Be tenacious and gently coax them out. There's not a lot of space to maneuver the wires or your fingers. The flat printed circuit connector that supplies video must be unlocked by first flipping up the latch. 
There we go. Finally, we can get a good look at the logic board. There is no processor visible. That must be on the other side. Next, remove the four screws that hold in the rear-facing stereo speaker unit. After disconnecting the three RF cables from the wireless module, they just pull off, and a couple of other cables after scraping off the glue, I was able to drop the entire unit out of the cabinet. I couldn't miss these copper heat pipes. They're right next to a fan. You can barely see it. It looks like the fan sucks in air from the front of the machine and blows it out the back, just below the speakers. Because there's so much packed into this projector, it's a long and obstructed path for the air. No doubt that interferes with cooling. If the light emitter is in the front facing back, then this is likely a mirror. Look at the heat sink keeping it cool. There's a circuit board here which must be part of the power supply for the light emitter. To the left of it, it has its own heat pipe. At the back below the heat sink is what appears to be a temperature sensor to tell the processor how hot the exhaust air is. We are still trying to get to the optical system and there is no easy access. And I've had to remove two screws that hold on the power supply board and one screw that holds on its heat sink. The plastic body enclosing the optical system seems to be made in two case halves that are screwed together in multiple places. And to get where I want to go, they have to be separated. That means I'm going to have to take off the heat sink for the mirror and the bottom plate as well. I'll have to strip down almost everything. This is where we are right now. I was able to separate the plastic halves underneath the fan and the heat sink. What I can see is that the fan is sandwiched between the heat sink and the light emitter. Meanwhile, the heat sink and the light emitter are inextricably connected together as a unit by the heat pipes. This is all that can be seen of the light emitter so far. For the next while, I looked for transverse running screws to remove to separate the case halves. This allowed me to liberate the fan and access the light emitter by bending back the heat sink connected to the heat pipes. It's probably not a good idea to do this, but at this point, I don't think this projector will ever be used again. Next, I removed the screws attaching the copper heat sink from the plastic housing so I could get a good close look at the LED. It appears to be a composite of LEDs in the form of a cob or chip on board LED bolted to the heat sink. Usually when LEDs or parts of a cob LED go bad due to overheating, you can see it. Bad LEDs often scorch or mottle the yellow phosphor and there is no evidence of that here. This cob LED is a type LYD2226X. They are available for about 28 Canadian dollars a piece on AliExpress. But since there's nothing wrong with it, let's see what else we can find. I was finally able to get it all apart. That revealed an incredibly thick concentrating lens, a couple of mirrors, the LCD unit, and a Fresnel lens and polarizer. Here is the LCD with its own polarizer. The long tail is the cable from the logic board. When I hold it up to a white background, I can see through it uniformly, as I should. It's possible that this is the source of the problem, but if it were damaged, I would expect to see some discoloration even with no power applied. It is type CBFH009 version 1, and it seems you can get this on AliExpress for about 50 bucks. Here are the two mirrors. No cracks or defects or places where the silvering has come off. So they're okay. Here is the Fresnel lens. Looks just fine to me. No cracks, no problems. Here is, oh, the other polarizer. Ah, I think we found the problem. Something caused this polarizer to overheat. Though it continues to polarize, the plastic has been scorched. Okay, this is why the projector stopped working, and it can't work without it. I checked AliExpress, and they have a 108 millimeter by 64.5 millimeter polarizer, which is, I think, this polarizer for about 22 and change. So the part is available.
So, can this projector be repaired? The answer is yes, but it's no holiday getting in. The next question is, is it worth it? It's an adequate projector, not especially bright, but it's still useful and it's still $300. If you're doing it yourself and you don't pay yourself very much, then maybe it's worth it. If you had to pay somebody else to fix it, it's not worth it. Right now, I have three choices. I can put this one back together, not likely. I can go out and buy another Moton N1, or maybe an N2, which must be much better than the N1 if I can believe the seller, or maybe get a better projector. That's probably the route I'm going to take. In the meantime, I have some research to do to figure out where I'm going to go, hopefully be able to use my home theater once again. I hope you enjoyed this video from Mr. Brown's basement. You were entertained, or maybe you learned something, or maybe you wasted about 10 minutes of your life. Please do give me a thumbs up and subscribe to Mr. Brown's basement if you're not already subscribed. You may notice that I'm not in the basement right now, and that's because a long story I'm not going to get into. But I'll be back in the basement soon. Thank you very much for watching and hope to see you again.